We now come to our interfaith panel, which is going to be chaired by Rhiannon Thompson. And I'm going to introduce Rhiannon, who will then introduce the panelists, and then it will be over to Rhiannon and the panel. Rhiannon is a former National Childbirth Trust trustee and honorary secretary. She's an environmentalist, a Green Trade Union branch rep, and a member of the Catholic Concern for Animals, uh, among many other things that she does. She has an interest in regional and indigenous languages and cultures and is a Welsh and Cornish languages learner. <laughs> now that's, that's a challenge. I wonder if that had anything to do with the lockdown <laughs> challenge. <laughs> She's also a university and adult education teacher. Rhiannon, we're so glad you could Thank you be so much. here. And <laughs> Bless you. over to you. Thank you, and, my, and indeed my colleague, Celia. Thank you so much for that warm, 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 warm introduction, Christine. Yeah, my name is Rhiannon Parry Thompson, and with my colleague, Sue Williamson, who you met a little bit earlier today, um, I'll be facilitating this discussion. Sue and I are part, as you probably know, of our guests from our lanyards, part of the Root and Branch planning team. So welcome, everybody, to to Interconnected, uh, the panel discussion where we'll be talking about interfaith dialogue, activity, and ministry, as well, and importantly, as women's contributions to their faith, their faith, their faith communities and opportunities, or, or lack thereof, for achieving their goals and fulfilling their vocations. Root and Branch, and that's all of us here in this room and all of us joining online, in its journeying to this point, has been informed and motivated and encouraged and enriched by the friendships that have been forged with women and men from other churches and faith backgrounds, that is for sure. And so and I think that an understanding of the diversity and richness of faith communities, of distinctive religious traditions, of the contributions that they make to wider civil society, help us all to deepen our understanding of our neighbors and indeed of our own faith. And in the Catholic Church, we take inspiration from those faith communities where, for example, women's vocations are not delimited. Yesterday, James Allison, many of you were here for him or heard him online, theologian, priest, and author said that, and I quote, in letting go of belonging, we are empowered to reach out to others as we, are see, as we see ourselves in them and them in ourselves. And on that note, an early Quaker, Isaac Pennington, stated in 1660, for this is the true ground of love and unity, not that such a man walks and does just as I do, but because I feel the same spirit and life in him. And so with this spiritual insight in mind, let's begin our discussion. And in a moment, we're gonna hear a recorded piece from Iris to start us going to set the scene from a lovely lady called Iris Iris Seagal, who's a council member of the Bristol and West Progressive Jewish Synagogue, or sorry, Progressive Jewish Congregation. Some of you Bristolians particularly may know that uh, particular congregation. And she's got a long-standing experience of interfaith dialogue and activity in Bath and West Wiltshire. And Iris delivers faith and cultural awareness training for all age groups. And then we're going to hear from Rabbi Alexandra Wright, whose may, name may be familiar to some of you. And she's going to be in conversation with Sister Margaret Shepherd, who's a good friend of Root and Branch. Margaret is a sister of Our Lady of Zion, and she completed rabbinical training at the Leo Beck College in London. And she was until recently an advisor on Catholic Jewish relations to the bishops of England and Wales. And she's a director, a former director of the Zion Center for Dialogue and Encounter, and is presently an Amadown Center trustee. Isn't that right, Christine? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just checking my facts. Um, Alexandra, Rabbi Alex, she was the first female uh, senior rabbi in England as rabbi of the Liberal Jewish Synagogue in London. And she's an active member of the Council of Christians and Jews and Alex has served as Jewish chaplain in a hospice interfaith chaplaincy team. There will be, we're going to hear just an excerpt of their particular video, that conversation between Margaret and Alex. But the longer recording is well worth listening to, well worth watching at a later date. And that will be available on our website. Okay, thank you. So we'll set the scene. Good afternoon. My name is Iris Segal, and I'm a member of the Bristol and West Progressive Jewish Congregation. As I'm not going to be able to be with you in person, I am pre-recording this message. 
on the day that the Jewish year begins. And so I would like to start by sharing with you a message that was forwarded to me from the uh, social media. It says, on the new year for Jewish people, I wish you a year where people of all faith and none join together to find a way to live in peace, love, and understanding for each other, where our similarities always override our differences. I think that this is a very powerful and pertinent message, especially since this is a panel for interfaith discussion. So in Bristol, there are a few organizations like the Bristol Interfaith Group, the Bristol Multifaith Forum. There is a new initiative, which Christine Clinch will probably be mentioning, trying to bring together the minorities, people from different backgrounds who live in the Bristol and surrounding areas. There is also the CCJ, which is the Council for Christian and Jews, as well as the Salam Shalom, an organization that deals with education about interactions between Muslims and Jews. As I live on the outskirts of Bristol, between Bath and West Wiltshire, I also am fortunate enough to be able to participate and interact with the Bath Interfaith Group and the West, Wish West Wiltshire Multifaith Forum. Within all of those organizations, you can see that there are different focuses. One of them is just to try and find out more about people from different backgrounds and from different religions and different customs. We have to acknowledge that without wanting, we might be suspicious or even fearful of people who are different than us, who have different features, different skin color, uh, who might dress differently or speak with an accent. Through the opportunity to meet and discuss in a safe environment all of our backgrounds and the way that we think, we are able to understand each other better and to realize that we have, as I read before, more in common than different. Another focus for these groups is the, let's say, social justice. It might be people who are interested in the climate change or people who feel very strongly about Black Lives Matter or people who want to help refugees or simply those who want to help people who don't speak English very well, to learn the language better, to understand how society works in, within the, the UK so that those newly arrived people can integrate better into the society. And so from my point of view, all the interfaith groups are helping us to live in a more friendly and neighborly atmosphere. And I have seen that develop within Bristol and Bath and in West Wiltshire. People become friends through their interactions on these different panels and organizations. And the same happens with uh, education, whether it is for children or whether it is for grown-ups. The more we know about other people, the more we feel that we are all the same. It's not us and them. We are a wider community and we should be integrated while we preserve our own identities as well. Another point that I was asked to touch upon briefly is opportunities of women within progressive Judaism. And I think that just by mentioning that the current rabbi of the progressive synagogue in Bristol is a woman says it all. There are equal opportunities and any women who want to can pursue such a vocation. Also, lay leaders can be men or women. As long as you have enough knowledge, you are given the opportunity, or if you don't have enough knowledge, you will be getting the support in order to be able to do so. So I hope that this gives you enough 
food for thought for your discussion on interface. Thank you very much and goodbye. Hello, this is Margaret Shepherd. I'm a sister of the Congregation of Our Lady of Sion. And I'm Alexandra Wright. I'm the senior rabbi of the Liberal Jewish Synagogue in London. Some of you may have heard of my congregation. It's a bit special, I think, because its main work in the Catholic Church is that of dialogue. Dialogue principally between Jews and Christians. And I feel very fortunate to have been a Sister of Zion for so very many years now because it has brought me into contact with and most especially with friendship with so many Jewish friends like Alex um, and given me the opportunity to be involved with the Jewish community in this work of dialogue and with my own fellow Christians to help them understand the new teaching of the church with regard to the Jewish people. And I've had the privilege of working at one of our centers around the congregation, which is international, working at our London center. So that's been a huge privilege and opened many doors. So Alex, what about you? I mean, We've known each other for how many years? We won't tell everybody, it's only about 35. So we know each other pretty well. Um, what about you? I, I know how much you've given to the work of Jewish Christian dialogue, put it that in a very formal way, but what's it meant to you personally with, with your contact with the world of Christianity, with the Christians you know and have known and You've got a very special congreg congregation, your, your own community at the Liberal Jewish Synagogue, so many of whom I know. What's it meant to them? You've helped them understand this vital work, in my humble opinion, of dialogue. Thank you, Margaret. And um, you're right, we have known each other for a very long time. I hate to correct you. I think we've known each other for 40 years, actually. Oh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Um, and it's a really great privilege to be invited to be in dialogue with you at this Root and Branch Synod um, and to talk about experience of my own experience of interfaith dialogue and practice and what kind of difference it's made to me personally and to my congregation and to the wider Jewish community. I'm sure you know, Margaret, that my experience of interfaith dialogue and practice goes back way before even when I knew you, all the way back to my school days, I went to a very high church of England school from the age of seven with prayers every day. They had us on our knees, hands folded together on the hard gym floor. And of course, um, with readings from the New Testament, prayers that were very Christian, uh, divinity lessons and attendance at church at significant times of the Christian liturgical year. I always knew, however, that I was a Jew. There were a small number of us. In fact, the school took in a quota in those times and um, limited the number of Jewish girls that could go to that school. Um, as I grew up in the sort of became a teenager, I joined the school choir and we sang in the great religious works, the great masses like the Mozart Requiem, the Verdi Requiem, and the St. Matthew Passion. Yeah. And we joined with Westminster Boys School and sang in Westminster Abbey. And again, there's, there's always that sort of sense of knowing that in some way your story is a different one from the Christian story. And yet I was always very moved by the Christian story through learning, learning it through the music and through the, um, the words of the masses and the passion of Christ. Um, it set me down on the road towards the kind of dialogue that you and I have engaged in mm -hmm. and that I've done for the, for the last 35, 40 years. Mm -hmm. 
And knowing you has also been important as you engaged in a long period of study of Judaism at Leo Beck College, where the rabbis, where I trained to become a rabbi. And you opened so many different opportunities for me. In the beginning, I think we were both perhaps talking about rabbinic figures, Jewish people, generally educating the Jewish world about Jewish observance, history, belief, but more recently through scriptural reasoning and my involvement in the creation and publication of Deep Calls to Deep, a book of essays on the theology of Jewish Christian dialogue. I think that's shifted the balance. The balance has shifted. It's a more of a reciprocal relationship because Jews also need to learn about the Christian Bible, about what your central narrative is, the passion of Christ, what that means to you. So there is learning about other faiths, but doing that I think has also deepened my own appreciation of Judaism and that of my congregation, because Judaism didn't develop in a vacuum. Both Judaism and Christianity draw on the tradition of the Hebrew Bible, you know that all too well, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, our journey has been a sort of parallel journey in some ways, developed during the first centuries of the common era as sister religions, mm -hmm. often in competition, rivalry with each other. Mm -hmm. Our sources both betray hostility and that rivalry, but I think also creativity, you can see in the Passover ritual, Jews still today hold up a piece of unleavened bread, matzah, and recite the words, this is the bread of affliction our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. And of course, you know, when you look at the ritual of the Eucharist, you can see an almost parallel ritual there, but interpreted in a completely different way. And once we begin to recognize the common roots of our respective religions, I think we then begin to appreciate our respective religions in a different way, rather than as competitive and hostile rivals. Um, Thank you very much. A longer version of that, a nearly 20-minute version of that, will be on the website shortly. I, I strongly recommend you, 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 if you've got the time, to watch it all, that, watch that full conversation. Before Sue introduces the live panel, I will just say that Reverend Dr. Catherine Okoronko, the Bishop, the Bishop of Bristol's racial justice advisor, would have joined us online but sadly can't do so for personal reasons, and our prayers are with her. But we look forward to working with Cathy on another occasion very soon, we hope. So Sue's going to introduce the live panel without further yes, ado. Thank you. First of all, could we introduce Christine Clinch, who's a former religious education teacher, who has worked in very different regions of the world, and is now lead manager of the Amadan Conference and Retreat Center in Somerset. And she, we recommend the displays at the back if you want to try and visit it before it's taken down. And then we have Dr. Zainab Mai Bornu, I hope I said that right, is a lecturer at the University of Leicester. She's a Muslim from Nigeria. Her work focuses on resources, inequalities, marginalization, conflict, gender, and development. Welcome, Dr. Zainab. And we, we've already welcomed Dr. Reverend Richard Mackay, who can do it again. I'm always <laughs> pleased to do that. Who many of you met yesterday? Um, parish priest from St. Nicholas of Tolentino, where there are more than 60 nationalities represented. The community is known for its active inclusivity. And finally, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jane O'Hara, a scientist brought up a Catholic, is a secretary of the Bath Baha'i Spiritual Assembly. She's an active member of Bath's interfaith group and has been the chair of the Bath and North East Somerset Standing Advisory Council on Religious Education, SACRA, for many years. So welcome. Yeah, Jane. well, let's get going. Well, Iris is, we heard Iris a bit earlier on. Iris's belief, Iris Segal, that the more we know about other people, she said, the more we feel it's not 
them and us, it's not us and them. We're a wider community, we should be integrated while we preserve our own identities as well. And that resonates, of course, with what we've also just heard, which is Rabbi Alex's contention that, and I quote, once we begin to recognize the common roots of our respective religions, we then begin to appreciate our, religion, our religions in a different way, rather than as competitive and hostile rivals. And so perhaps this would be a good starting point for our discussion. A deeper understanding of our own religions and practices through an appreciation of our common roots and branches, or unity, as the Quaker Isaac Pennington put it. So I, I'm wondering, colleagues and friends, if you could perhaps address this, this, this idea of a deeper understanding, interfaith dialogue giving us a deeper understanding of our own religions and practices through that appreciation of our common roots, the common roots that we all have, or the unity, as it's also been described. And I wonder whether you could address this, perhaps in the context of your own experience and your understanding of interfaith dialogue and practice. I don't know Jane. who wants to start. Who wants to start? <laughs> Thanks, <Yep>. Jane. <laughs> I drew the short straw. Um, yes, I, I think this is a question I'd love to address, actually, because, um, as was mentioned, I was brought up a Catholic, and uh, after a period of questioning, I came across um, a new religion, which is the Baha'i Faith, and in case you haven't heard about it before, I'll just say, it's actually, it's in, in its very early days, it, we all feel that like we're early Christians, really, because we've still got that I idealism. Um, it's, we're in one, year 178, so Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, came in the mid-1800s at a time when the world was very different. And he came to a part of the world which at the time was supposed to be civilized, but actually had very brutal practices among, the high, among all levels of society, actually, and widespread corruption, which was Persia. Um, and um, Baha'u'llah re brought the revealed word of God, as Jesus did, as um, Muhammad did, as Buddha did, as all the founders of the major religions did. And what one of his central teachings is that all religions have the same spiritual truth and that they're all telling us about the same God, although we call that entity a different name. I was going to say he, but I don't want anybody to be offended by that. That's just a generic he. So we do tend to say he for God, but it's not... God, of course, has no gender. Gender is irrelevant in the spiritual world, which might come in <laughs> at another part of this discussion. So, um, so Baha'u'llah, uh, I, I felt this was a very exciting teaching because, of course, as I'd been getting older and moving away from the Catholic Church, which in my early days, it was forbidden, really, to go into any other religious establishment. So I, I didn't know what happened in those uh, synagogues and other churches. So I was quite um, interested to find out that actually a lot of the religions are very similar and they've all got, uh, as Bahá'u'lláh says, the same spiritual teachings. And um, he actually um, says also that the, um, th this is because there's a covenant with God which has existed from the beginning of time. God has been guiding us through all the centuries of our development and will always guide us. So we never need to feel that we're alone. There's always that wisdom to draw upon. And it comes to us through these very special people who are the founders of the great world religions. Baha'i faith is recognized as a world religion now. And um, so it's nothing, um, nothing you need to be uh, worried about. It's nothing weird. It's actually, I think you'd find it very rational and very... You, well, anyway, that's a separate story. But um, so when I became, when I was learning about the Baha'i Faith, I then wanted to find out about different religions. So what I'm going to say is that this is my uh, motivation, really, for getting involved in the interfaith group when I um, came back to Bath, um, and I uh, found over the years that um, we have many similarities, and we work together in fellowship. We don't try to. Um, find issues where we're all sharply divided because that's divisive. We look for commonalities and we find there are many, many, many commonalities and the most successful meetings we've had have been where we've all been addressing the same subject from different religious points of view. It can be angels, it can be charity, it can be uh, justice, it can be all kinds of things and we find that uh, there's a great warmth and fellowship. Um, that's 
probably enough Thank you for very me. Much. You, you were saying to me uh, on the phone the other day, Jane, that um, the multi-interfaith groups that you're involved in are truly eclectic, aren't they? Yes, that's something I should mention. So we have... Um, we have uh, Jewish, that's Iris, um, we have Islamic, we have uh, Buddhist, we have Hindu, we have about five different kinds of Christianity, which includes some of the ones which some people regard as a bit fringe, but we welcome them all. Um, so we have um, Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, yep. we have um, otherwise known as Mormons, but they don't like to be called that anymore. We have um, Christian scientists, and um, we have had the Unification Church, which in my youth, we used to call the Moonies. Some of you know this. So it's been really interesting to meet these people and to find out that they're all uh, well-intentioned, um, spiritual people following their own pathways. And we also have a Druid. Um, yeah. Yes, because I mean, if all human beings are equally God's creation, which is your fundamental tenet, that is correct. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. That's really helpful. Thank you. Do you want to pass the mic to Richard? Are you okay to take this up? Thank you. <laughs> I'll try. Um, <laughs> I, I think fundamentally uh, interfaith work has to start in the heart. It has to start in, the, in a heart that's open. Um, James, uh, in our last talk, spoke very powerfully about uh, the universality, of what is authentic Catholicity. And the authentic Catholicity is to become a sacrament of the universal heart of God's universal love. And therefore, uh, the starting point for all interfaith work I, and involvement, I think, has to start with a heart that welcomes the presence of the Spirit, the truth of God, in other communities other than your own, so that you can learn from that. And that's something that, uh, uh, having been... Uh, uh, prepared for the priesthood, trained shortly after the Second Vatican Council, very shortly after the Second Vatican Council, this key document, Nostra Aetate, that's been referred to, uh, is so seminal and uh, so important, and I think in the, in the wider Christian church, because of course there are many parts of the Christian church that sadly, um, you know, unless you profess very publicly that Jesus is your Lord, then you are not saved. And uh, so I think we've got a real responsibility to express not only in our words, but in our actions, in our priorities, that God's heart is universal and God is, there is nowhere where God is not present. Nowhere. And in no one. So, my parish, uh, the, the parish I'm privileged to be part of and serve uh, in the inner city of Bristol, well, we have, uh, I last count, something like 12 or 15 mosques, um, some large, some small. Um, we have two seat Gurdwaras. Um, we, on the edge of the parish is the Hindu temple uh, and also the Baha'i um, uh, center. And we have the Jewish uh, uh, liberal synagogue also. Um, so we have plenty of opportunities. We also have all sorts of varieties <coughs> of the Christian tradition too. Now, now that presents a certain issue and problem. Uh, how do you relate to everybody? <laughs> how do you build up relationships? Um, and in the context of, uh, you know, a kind of community where everything is happening, um, and you have so many issues that are calling you um, for attention, calling you and your community. Um, what I'd like to see in what we... Um, uh, Margaret's sitting at the back there, and Margaret has a background in interfaith work, and on behalf of our parish community, when there are major feasts in other uh, religious traditions, we send greetings and through Margaret uh, on behalf of our parish community. I have served on the multi-faith multi forum um, and have also been part of broad-based um, broad community organizing in the, um, in the early days when it first came to this country. And in fact, I have to say that was my richest experience of interfaith work. When 
we began to relate together as communities, communities facing social issues in the city of Bristol. And for me, that has been the most fruitful experience, in fact, when, you, when we weren't, in, weren't exactly looking at each other, but we were standing together looking at the world in which we were trying to bring creative, positive change for justice and equality. And I've always found that a very precious time and uh, greeted its demise in Bristol with great sadness. Um, so there are many ways that we... I, I think if you have the heart for the interfaith, you will take the opportunities that are presented. So, for instance, I found myself... Um, uh, being invited to pray alongside uh, an imam in one of our mosques at the time of Lee Rigby's killing as an act of reconciliation. In fact, it was two different mosques I was asked to do that. Um, we uh, invited um, uh, the rabbi, um, R Rabbi Monique, from the Jewish Liberal Synagogue to lead our parish community in an authentically Jewish Passover meal instead of our version of it, <laughs> um, which was great fun. Um, and uh, was really opened eyes of our community to the, to the roots of the Eucharist in, the, in, our, in our Jewish heritage, and it is our Jewish heritage as yeah. Christians. Um, and there are many other ways, many other opportunities. Um, uh, we, one of the main ways we as a church, I think, touch the interfaith work, multi-faith, multicultural area of, of commitment is particularly through our Borderlands charity in terms of well, being a place of welcome. Um, I can't do a funeral in my church on a Monday or a Tuesday um, because the place is crawling with um, people from all over the world, uh, refugees and part of the asylum community. And um, we, were all, we were a bit worried that many of our Muslim refugees may find it difficult coming into a church with Christian imagery because we love icons and things, you know. Um, and, uh, but not a bit of it. And in fact, we, one of the things we've actually discovered is that for many of our Muslim sisters and brothers, they value being in a, a place, a safe, welcoming place mm -hmm. that actually values faith. You don't have to leave it at the door. Yeah. No one's trying to proselytize you or change you, your faith, but welcoming and valuing um, the faith of the other. Hmm. So that's just a Thank few you. ways that we have tried to uh, live what is in the heart, which is hopefully the universal love of God. Thank you. I love that valuing other faiths. It's, just, it's, it's a safe place to be when that happens, isn't it? Thank you, Richard. Christine. Oh, you've got to put your own mic. I've got my own <laughs> no, pass it to say now, please. <laughs> Good. Good afternoon. Um, I was just wondering, as Richard was talking about the different faith buildings um, that you can find in Bristol and the different faiths that are represented here, what your thoughts were when we talked, when he touched on the diversity of Christian faiths, there was a little ripple of laughter. <laughs> and I wonder what we were thinking and, and in that response, what, what our assumptions are about each of those faiths and the people who follow those faiths. One of the things that happens in Bristol, usually every year, sadly not during COVID, but hopefully it will restart um, when we get to the stage that we can, is something called Diverse Doors Open Day. And on one Sunday, I think it's usually in February, um, the doors of different places of worship, um, that's um, doors of different faiths and different um, brands of Christianity, um, they open their doors and um, it's an opportunity to go in 
and, and to be welcomed into that place. And some people join a group and go together. And we usually take a group from Amadown. Um, but, but also you can go in as individuals or with friends and go in and sit in that place and meet people from that faith and learn so much. I came to Amadan just four years ago and I was originally appointed as the Interfaith Project Coordinator. And with the rise in hate crime, um, the center wanted to look at ways of addressing hate crime. What, what could we do in a predominantly white area? As I look back at almost 50 years of work at Amadan, um, they, they set off from a Catholic tradition. They are a Christ, we are a Christian retreat center. Um, and from the, um, the voice of the Second Vatican Council to come together ecumenically and to bring together people of different faiths. And that was the foundation on which Amadan was built. And as I looked over the past and what, what had been done and achieved, there was a lot of education um, about different faiths, a lot of dialogue about bringing people together to learn from each other, um, very much what Iris was touching on and Sister Margaret and the rabbi. Um, but also, it was talking about a safe place, creating a safe place where people could come together. And I think that's one of the things that we've really tried to create at Amadan. When um, we started off, I got together with two Muslim women. Um, I tried to meet many people in the community, and people would say, oh, you need to meet so-and-so, and you need to meet so-and-so. Well, I met Fazana and I met Fadua, <laughs> and the three of us sat down together, and the first thing we did was to organize um, a, an event for women and to enable Syrian refugee women to tell their story. And we created a safe space where they felt comfortable to share their story, which um, at that time, we didn't include men in the audience, and we hope they weren't offended, but we wanted to create a safe space for them to tell their story first. This was the first time they were telling and sharing their story. And the response is huge. To be in the same room as the story, the person who has experienced that story is incredible. And that story I know will have been taken home to the dinner table, to the next time people met for coffee, um, to share that story of coming together. And so it continued and um, we held um, something called an iftar that many of you may know. My, Friend here, Zainab, um, when the Muslims fast, they break the fast in the evening and come together to say the prayers and to eat a meal together. And here in very white Somerset, we welcomed our Muslim friends to come together and we had an evening where about 40 Muslims and 40 people who were not Muslim joined together and, and the the imam told us, taught us a little bit about fasting in the Muslim tradition, and then we converted one of our conference rooms um, into a prayer hall. We covered it with white sheets, and uh, the Muslim men prayed at the front, the women at the back, and those who were not Muslim were invited to come and observe, and then we shared the meal together. It was a real way of breaking down our assumptions about the other, about breaking down the barriers that we create, and to have real conversations. When I talked about the work of Amadan in different places, I remember after one church service, some, someone coming up to me and saying, I'm a little bit scared about meeting people from other faiths. We're trying to create a safe place where everyone feels welcome, where everyone is listened to, where everyone is heard. Thank you very much, yeah. Zainab. Thank you. That's a really good note to take the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So, as a Muslim, my religion teaches me love, respect, tolerance, and most of all, understanding. 
coming to the UK, starting my PhD at the University of Bath, one of my sisters said to me, Zainab, don't wear the hijab, don't wear the abaya. And I was like, why? She said, because if they look at you, they will think you're a terrorist, they will think you're bad, you know, as a Muslim, you don't like people. And I said to her, I'm a Nigerian. I will live my life the way I know in Nigeria. Why? Because 50-50 between Muslims and Christians. They're my friends. I grew up with them. I, go, I went to school with them. I engaged with them till today. You know, so there's this understanding sometimes within our community, the Muslim community, that we are not really welcome we're not really accepted because of misunderstandings, you know, misconceptions about Islam. But really, Islam is a religion of peace. So any opportunity to engage in interfaith dialogue, I see it as an opportunity to come. And I say to people, ask me if you don't understand. Ask me about Islam, and I will tell you. And when it's time to say my prayers, for example, even if it's in a meeting, I can take excuse and go and say my prayers. I want, when I came here, I asked Rihanna, okay, is it okay for me to say my prayers? And she said, yes. So we need to come together to share experiences. For example, issues affecting women as one. And one major observation, which I think the, the last speaker before our session said, that person spoke about the absence of the youth. When we talk about understanding religion, especially Islam, Christianity, and you know, um, Jewish religion and the others. We need to engage with them. It goes beyond you know, some of us that are sitting here. So I came today, I learned a lot. And my plan is to go back and share within my own Muslim networks, especially my Muslim sisters, to tell them, you know, this is what I learned. Because this is a space where you're trying to talk about rights, OK? for women especially. We want women's voices to be heard. Part of my work relates to giving a platform where women will be heard because they have a right. They're human. But you see, the problem is sometimes, not all, we don't really understand these rights, these rights, okay? Going back to Africa, maybe Nigeria, go to the local communities. There are so many women that, and girls that are going through a lot. They don't understand. They don't even know that they have rights. So how do you even begin, you know, fighting or for your right when you don't even know that you're entitled to some of these things? And religion plays a very big role to us Africans, you know, especially Nigeria, for example. So it's the imams, the reverend fathers, the pastors, among other things. But this issue that was raised in terms of disenchantment with the establishment, here I'm talking about the religious establishment, is really important. So I think more interaction, more dialogue between the religions, okay, is really important. And we need to bring in the younger generation. Get them, yes, there are issues, but we're not bringing, we're not coming together to force anything on anyone. For example, it's not about forcing Islam on anyone. I'm here, I'm a Muslim. But no one is telling me to dump my religion and accept another religion. No. It is about sharing, you know, and learning from other people just so that to move forward, you know, we can have lessons, you know, we could share among other things. So at the University of Bath, doing my PhD, I participated in, you know, interfaith um, sessions where I spoke about blasphemy in Islam, for example. In Islam, for me, it is my religion, and for you, it is yours. So I have to respect you and tolerate your own views, not to enforce my own, as against maybe thinking about, no, Islam is violent, among other things. So I see this as an opportunity for us to come together. It doesn't really stop here, and my intention is to ask you know, the root and branch synod, so what happens? After, to, after tomorrow, what happens? I am thinking about, because my research, I work with women, predominantly Christians, and there are issues that came up to do with rights, reproductive health, okay? In our areas, contraception, for example, is not free. Where you have people that don't even have enough 
to feed. Sometimes you go throughout without food to eat. And then you have to pay for contraception, for example. You would rather focus on feeding yourselves and your family, okay? There are so many young girls, young women, you see them at a very young age. Some of them have four or five children from different men. Not men that they are married to, which for us in Africa, it is about marriage, okay? Both Islam and Christianity, it's not that we really understand maybe this is my partner, you know, within the African perspective, so no disrespect intended. So I believe a lot has to be done in terms of interfaith, the churches, the mosques. We need to hear the voices of the women, those marginalized, those relegated, the youth. They have a lot to say, but without such opportunities, then I see us heading for major issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Well, this is women. The women there. Uh, he, uh, thank you so much. I mean, you're, I know you're staying for the next session, and we're going to get a taste of, of, of what's you know, what's likely to happen next. And we very much hope that the four of you, and in fact, all of you, of course, will be part of that conversation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, women. You have mentioned women. Thank you for doing that. So that takes me to Sue's question. Well, which yes. um, we're running a little bit out of time, but we wanted to have as many diverse yeah. voices as possible on the platform. But Sue has a re very relevant question for well, we, four we of you. We both have, really. But yeah. it's just, what, do you, what gifts do you think women bring to your particular faith? And is there a, are the glass ceilings still? We know the glass ceilings are in the Catholic Church, but we don't necessarily know One in other places. So um, if anyone likes to talk about the gifts that women bring to their particular faith. Thank you. Yes, well, I, I suppose you might be all glad to hear that the newest religion um, doesn't have glass ceilings. We don't have any ministry. So our spiritual authority is the word of God. And we keep going back to the revelation, which we believe was, came through Baha'u'llah. But we, are, we also call ourselves people of the book. In other words, we are an, an Abrahamic religion. We also acknowledge the truth in the, the Bible, in the Quran, in the... Um, Torah and in the other sacred writings. But many of those were not written down by the actual founder of the religion, with the exception of Muhammad, of course, who wrote the Quran or who had the, dictated the Quran. So, um, anyway, that's getting off the subject. But um, so, one of the uh, basic principles of the Baha'i faith is the equality of men and women. Remember, this was first talked about in the, or was talked about in the mid 1800s where in Persia, the women were still in Purda and wearing the face coverings and so on. And um, so the idea is that in the sight of God, there is no gender, there's no difference between the genders. There are differences, biological differences between men and women. As we know today, this is a spectrum. Um, but you could use the analogy of the, uh, the two wings of a bird, or yeah. indeed two hands, but the two wings of a bird, without the two wings, which are the same and yet different, the bird can't fly. So it's essential that women should be given full equality with men. And in fact, as I think in all religions, women are often the ones who do a lot in the actual oh. field, but it's not exclusive. They, we work together with men. And um, as I say, there aren't any barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you could just make some short points. Sorry, colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all three of you, please. Well, you've heard so much about the, cats, <laughs> the glass ceiling in the Catholic Church. I can church. never hear enough. So, uh, <laughs> so, and I just want to say that glass ceiling has to be shattered. It has to be shattered. Thank you, Richard. But there's so much work to be done among the women of the church to understand that they can need to shatter. They mustn't accept that glass that glass ceiling. And there's so much work to be done among uh, uh, the Catholic clergy to, to, to penetrate you know, the, uh, the, the heart, the, the head, the heart, and the guts. Yeah. And uh, lots, of, lots of work has to be done with the guts to put your head above the parapet and speak truth and speak truth to power yeah. and power in the church. So we, the glass ceiling must go. And we, we just need, we need to find more and more creative ways within our parish communities to uh, welcome the voices 
and uh, values and ministries of, that are at the moment are open and possible and expand those to the limits within the average kind of parish. And I think that's a work that has to be done. We have to work in our parishes mm. to bring about this conversion one way or another. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Switch. I was just reflecting on this question in the context of Amadan and how it was inspired by the Second Vatican Council mm. and then initially it was the Sisters of Sion who were resident and ran the centre for many years um, and how it has become more and more ecumenical. And actually today there are more women than men that are leading. Um, and I was reflecting on, uh, we, we have different groups from different Christian denominations, different faith groups who come and run their own courses and will come to chapel. And um, we, Amadan has their own prayers, which are um, inclusive and welcoming of everyone. Um, and I just wondered, uh, for those who are coming from a tradition where, which is still very male-dominated, how they feel coming into our space, which is, has become more female-dominated, in fact. So it's just a thought. That's a good question. <laughs> Thanks so well, much. How does that feel? Um, but, but the aim is for everyone, not yeah. for one to be more than the other, but for, for everyone to come and worship together um, and to be in the space together and eat and drink together and, and for us to see that we are different but that's okay. Yeah. And and to appreciate our diversity and celebrate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. So in Islam, actions shall be judged according to intentions. So whatever you do, you do with an open mind and you do it because of Allah. That is how we look at it. So in terms of roles played by women, if I start, I don't think we'll end. We'll continue. <laughs> because women play major roles in the society. Even when it comes to religion, it is the mother or the grandmother that will make sure you wake up, you know, you go to school. In Islam, we come back, then we go to the Islamia, the Islamic schools, we learn. In most cases, it is the mother that will make sure that you say your prayers and she will ask you, okay, recite what you learned, you know, so that if you make a mistake, they correct you. In terms of the peace and conflict dynamics in Nigeria, for example, women groups play major roles, but you don't hear their voices. Rather, we have men, with all due respect, you know, to the men here, that tend to speak for the women. Why not speak with the women? Because it is about them. They should be able to share their experiences. So going back to the issues of power, patriarchy, hierarchies, you know, I think opportunities like this, we really have to look for ways where we can disrupt the norm, peacefully of course, you know, in terms of giving voices to the voiceless because a lot needs you know, to be learned in terms of women's roles in the society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, what, what the four of you have been addressing, I think, essentially, is a point that a questioner earlier on this afternoon said, at the end of her question, unity in diversity. And that's that unity that we need to hold on. This conversation, incidentally, colleagues, has only just begun. You'll be back. So thank you. Can I hand it back to you, Christine? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Rianne, and, and the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.